So the prehistory of private property, um, implications for modern political theory by Grant McCall and I. This is the second in our series of books on prehistory. Uh, I, when I became a philosopher, did not think I would be writing about prehistory. But uh, as I go through philosophy with social contract theory and Lockean property theory, I found so many people in philosophy making claims about uh, prehistory, not backing that up, that uh, I think these, these claims need to be debunked. So eventually, as I started looking into these claims, reading anthropology, I met Grant McCall, an anthropologist at Tulane University, who was also working on debunking things that people say about prehistory that just simply aren't true. Um, so at 10 years later, we have two books. The first one, uh, Prehistoric Myths in Modern Political Philosophy, uh, we spent most of it debunking the claim we talked about last week, the Hobbesian hypothesis or the mutual advantage hypothesis that our economy or our political system actually achieves mutual advantage relative to a uh, society that has uh, neither a private property rights system nor a, uh, nor a sovereign government. And we found both claims extremely wanting, that, they're, that uh, both versions of that mutual advantage hypothesis are false. That's what we did in the first book. So now in this second book, The Prehistory of Private Property, we look at three more claims. The inequality hypothesis, the market freedom hypothesis, and the individual appropriation hypothesis. We define those as the inequality hypothesis is defined as, um, as significant hierarchy or stratification is natural and inevitable. That it is, uh, uh, that it is, uh, it, it is in either impossible to have a society where people are, are significantly equal politically, socially, and economically. Um, or there's another claim that is very close to this one that it might be possible to do that, but in order to have a equality, you would have to sacrifice freedom. That's the inequality hypothesis. Then the market freedom hypothesis, and that is that negative freedom is better preserved under capitalism than under any other economic system. We address that claim in book chapters five through six um, of the book. And then the claim that takes us, that takes the most time to be bunked is uh, the individual appropriation hypothesis, um, or we call it the natural property hypothesis, that there's something natural about individualist unequal property rights. Another way to put it is that the application of the normative principles of appropriation theory uh, that's used in Lockean theory and contemporary natural rights arguments of private property, that these principles of appropriation and voluntary transfer, if you apply them to the real world, actually support strong private property rights. So people that pr creating private property rights of the time that uh, the, the type that markets, market uh, libertarians support is actually some sort of a natural right that people naturally create. And it puts ethical limits on collective power to tax, regulate, and redistribute property. We look at all three of these claims, where they come from, who says them, how are they continue to be used in contemporary political thought. Then we debunk each one of them. So what we're going to do, I'm going to divide the presentation and discussion into four parts today. Um, the first part, we'll look at the inequality hypothesis. Um, I'll present that section of the book, chapters uh, two, three, and four. Uh, then we'll have our discussion. Which one of you is going to be discussing that? So uh, I'm going to do um, inequality hypothesis as well as the market freedom hypothesis. Okay. And Andrea is going to do the, the last chunk, chunk. Okay, great. Um, so, so I'll talk about that and then um, 
and then Benedict will discuss, then we'll all, and we'll all discuss together. Then we'll, uh, I'll talk about the market freedom hypothesis and Benedict will discuss again. Then, uh, and then we'll all discuss. Then in the, in the next part, we'll have the individual appropriation hypothesis. Um, and following that, we'll have another discussion, maybe a little mini presentation by me, with when we talk about the implications of the book as a whole. So that's how we're organized today. We have two hours for uh, to discuss an entire book. That's a little short for a book, but we'll do the best we can. Okay, so in chapter two of the book, it's called Hierarchies of Colleges, Part One. And we start out looking at ancient history of people who have made this claim that inequality is. Um, you still have to hide the ones that don't have their video on. Still won't work. So, um, so um, the uh, uh, so the um, we look way back in history and talk about go to ancient China and the ancient Mediterranean area and talk about talk about how people were arguing that inequality was natural and inevitable. And then we show throughout history in various times and various places, who's making this claim and why are they saying that it's inevitable? Um, and they're all, and what we find is, and I'm not gonna go through every, all these different examples. It's really kind of interesting to go through all of them, but the point of going through all why inequality is there's all this agreement that inequality that inequality is natural inevitable and equality is impossible but all these different arguments why it's it is impossible why is it impossible to have equality and what you find is what people in chiefdoms are saying is different than what people in ancient china were saying which is different than what people in ancient greece were saying were saying which is different but the, to what medieval Christians were saying and early modern people, everybody has a different reason, but they all are justifying the same thing. Inequality is natural, and they use it. They all use these arguments, these claims. They all use this claim that inequality is natural and inevitable to create a system where they maintain existing power structures that cause inequality and stratification with, and, and, and with force, that use force to maintain a system of uh, existing inequality. So the pattern suggests one thing, that the pattern suggests that it's an unfounded rationalization, that if we can't, if, if equality was actually natural and inevitable, we would agree why. And we would agree what type of inequality. Some are trying to justify inequality by birth. Some are talking about adjusting inequality by how much money you want. Some about political inequality between different tribes and groups and so forth, or caste inequality or racial inequality. Uh, so the pattern suggests that what we have really is a rationalization. The fact that the arguments for these contradict each other and also the, felt, the, 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 the idea that they needed to use force to, to uh, enforce the hierarchical system all implies that they're probably false. That, that, they're, pro that they're probably false. Uh, if inequality were natural, inevitable, we wouldn't need so much force to enforce all these different inequalities. Now then, in chapter three, Hierarchies of Apologists, part two, um, we look at contemporary theories and see how it's used in contemporary theories. And that tends to happen in two different ways. One, you get a functionalist sort of Hobbesian argument for inequality that there has to be inequality to enforce rules. The king has to be above other people to enforce rules. Um, so there has to be inequality for reasons like that. This I doubt when you look at the fact that uh, you can have, say, a very low status police officer 
uh, arrest a very high status uh, movie star or some other celebrity. Um, that the person enforcing the rules doesn't necessarily have to be above other people in the hierarchy. There does have to be some definitive decision-making process. Why that has to have hierarchy, I don't know. Then there's a new one, a new one that doesn't appear so much in history, and that is inequality is not impossible, but it conflicts with freedom. So it's impossible to have an, un an equal society that uh, that is also a free society. And then, and these new versions fit the old pattern. They contradict with each other, and they're all justifying systems that use force to enforce equality. I'm uh, sorry, to enforce inequality. So it all implies that these arguments are saying, well, we have inequality because we have to. We can't help it. We've got to have, we have inequality. Equality is impossible. So, so don't even bother arguing against it. That's really the point of all of these. Um, but there's reason to doubt all of them. And so then what we do, so that's chapters two and three. Now in chapter four, the last chapter in this section, we look at evidence. Is there evidence that, that inequality is impossible? Now, you know, to prove it's impossible would, would be very difficult. You have to show every single society that ever existed. However, to, to prove that it is possible, you only need to find one example, one society that is an equal society. And, and that would show by that would show. Uh, if you claim something's impossible, if you find one example of that thing thought to be impossible, it proves that it's not, in fact, impossible. And uh, what we find is, so we look at we look at societies that were outside of the of what people were familiar with when they make this claim. Uh, generally, small scale societies, uh, societies that. Uh, that have existed throughout history, but are now relegated to the most remote places, to uh, to the Amazon, to places like Borneo, uh, uh, non-state societies in very out of the way places. There aren't very many left, but a lot of them survived into the 20th century and were observed by anthropology. And one thing that we find is sexism is as old as humanity. And Sexism needs to be understood as male dominance. There are, sexism is not one gender oppressing another because, well, it would be if we could find some examples where there actually were societies where women dominate the way men do. And in, in known to either history or ethnography or anthropology, there are no examples of. A, a sexist society where it's the women who are on top. Either things are just about equal or men are oppressing women. And when you want to talk about sexism, you've got to understand it in that way. It's not two groups that don't get along. It is one group that is that across so many different cultures tends to be putting itself above another. Now, um, now and there is at least some amount of sexism in every society, but not all societies are equally sexist. And what we find in very in the smallest, loosest, most non-state society we know of, uh, groups that are often called bands or immediate return societies or egalitarian societies, are band are, are groups of small groups of people who are nomadic foragers and do not store food. They move from place to place, hunting and gathering and consuming what they hunt and gather that night without saving it. Um, and what you find in these societies is that, is that you get very significant political equality. You get significant gender equality, not perfect, but very significant. You have equal freedom, which we argue in the next, in the next section when we talk about how people are very free in a society. And, uh, that, uh, so this whole, the whole other section of the book on that, I won't dwell on that. You get people who are eating the same food, staying in the same shelter, wearing the same types of clothing, using the same types of tools, and being able to demand that other people share their tools with you if they have something they're not using or more stuff than they need. Equal land access, etc. 
Um, and some people looking for examples of, of inequality have resorted to counting calories to find out, okay, well, does this person who's a really good hunter, do they consume more calories than other people do, other people who are not malnourished? Um, well, if you got to resort to, if you're looking for inequality, you got to resort to counting calories among, uh, among healthy people. I think you've got a society that's actually very equal. Um, and one of the really interesting things is, is how it is maintained. Um, people maintain it through, through, through leverage that they have. What you have is in a, in a nomadic band like this, you have people who are free to leave each other, but actually kind of need each other. They don't need this specific group of people but they need to be with some other people. Because what happens if you go out and hunt by yourself, you'll, you'll do all right most of the time, but some days you're not going to, you're not going to get anything and you're going to come home hungry. Uh, it's much better to hunt with a group of people where you're all going out separately and then you're unlucky today, somebody else is lucky today and then somebody else is lucky the day after that and then you're lucky after that. That it's, you want people to go out hunt and bring back what they have and share it. Well, under those circumstances, you've got to get people to play along voluntarily. If we have this image of native peoples having the Indian chief and the medicine man and they rule top down and order people around and stuff like that, and this does not happen in the smallest scale society, you get People who sit around and talk and say, you want to do this, you want to go over here this time, you want to go hunting, let's have the hunting, well, whatever you want to do. But you've got people who are free to go out and hunt and bring back what they have and share, but they're also free to go out and hunt. And if they want, not come back at all, but go and join the band next door or go live by themselves for a while or just, or just them and one or two other people. And you do see these groups being very fluid and breaking up and getting back together again. And under those circumstances where everyone is free to leave, it is hard for anyone to lord it over everyone else. And it becomes possible to ridicule somebody who tries to lord it over people, to criticize people who are being lording it over people, to be disobedient, even to, to kick somebody out. Uh, people will desert somebody or refuse to cooperate with somebody that's putting themselves ahead of others. They also do it with, uh, with a tool they call demand sharing. It's widely agreed within the group that if somebody asks for something you have, you have to give it or everyone else all day will tell you how stingy they are and at, at, uh, all day until you get sick of it and give it to them or they'll just tolerate it if the other person takes it while you're not looking. Um, they will appeal to egalitarian religious belief and in extreme, they will, uh, many bands have, have executed people for, uh, for trying to lord it over people. Um, there are, so that proves a possibility. Now people might say, well, that proves a possibility for these societies that, uh, that uh, there's really no chance of me joining one. What about the state society? Well, um, in state society, we don't have the same kind of leverage. We're not all free to just walk away from our society and join another one at any, any evening we feel like it. But we can employ these sorts of strategies, the ridicule, the criticism, disobedience, if we give people the freedom to disobey other people, we can use these sorts of strategies created. And some states, the, uh, the evidence isn't great, but there is significant evidence of history of state societies, um, some Mesoamerican societies, uh, the Harappan society in, uh, in this valley and other states that have come and gone in various places that have been, that have been, um, that have been, as far as we can tell, uh, much more egalitarian than some of our contemporary states. And if you also find out, and if you also look at the range of states that exist today, we get some that are very hierarchical and some that are less so. We don't have any that are, that are as equal as band societies, but we do have some that are much more equal. All right, uh, I'll turn it over to 
Benedict for replies. So, um, what can I say? Um, I thought that the uh, the historical overview of um, you know how different um, different populations who lived in different times justified inequalities was was quite interesting. Looking at um, that they were all essentially how I read it was that they all essentially had one common denominator in one way or another, either because they were beneficiaries or they didn't want to um, question the system they were living in. They all kind of justified their system and justified the inequalities and sort of molded their, their look at their environments around the fact that they were unequal. Um, and the most shocking example of that was uh, the example of eugenics, which yeah. was definitely a thing in Germany, as we <laughs> all know. And um, but you got it from <laughs> yeah, we England and the United States. Exactly. I mean, it eugenics has. Uh, oh, sorry. Does everyone here know what eugenics is? Social Darwinism. Um, the belief that evolution needs our help. That we have to have the survival of, that that uh, the survival of the fittest isn't working anymore. That we're letting weak people live and breed, and that is harming the DNA stock of everyone. So, and their basic strategy for that was was uh, have have uh, rich people uh, have more kids and give have poor people have less kids. Yeah, and um, as we all know, Germany took that to its probably most perverted form in the 1930s and 40s, uh, committing mass genocide. Yeah, and um, and, and so 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 I, um, some people might not know the the most eugenic um, the most eugenic thing that they did was not actually the Holocaust of the Jews or the Romani or the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, but or even homosexuals, but of the disabled. You they were killing. They, they were killing disabled people because uh, for for this fear that um, that those disabled people would pollute the gene pool of everyone else. And the United States did something like that, not killing them, but actually did have rules that if uh, people with certain disabilities wanted to get married, they had to uh, they had to get sterilized. I mean, they also did it to indigenous people and people of color. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. But the, the most, the one that was, some of those are just, well, that's just racism. But the uh, the focusing on the indigenous was the most one that was most obviously eugenic. I mean, they did have eugenic explanations for why this race was better than that one. But uh, but the most eugenic reasoning was in the singling out the disabled. So, go on. So um, just adding that there is an amazing book about eugenics in the Third Reich. It's called Fog in August, um, about uh, a disabled kid that was uh, euthanized by the regime. Warmly recommended. It's an amazing read. Um, so, anyways, and what I so even though so even though the, the idea of eugenics was um, was you know prevalent in many states, I found it compelling because obviously. Uh, in the history of my country, it was, it was, you know, a very, you know, uh, a very dark chapter. And reading up into the eugenics, uh, the eugenics uh, sort of paragraph, I found it in, uh, pretty insane that there was support for eugenics both on the political left and the political yeah. right. So across the political spectrum, you had the sort of system just justification in a way. Everybody sort of tried to justify the inequalities that were going on and they resorted to pseudoscience and they resorted mm -hmm. to um absolutely ridiculous ideas from a 21st century uh, perspective in order to justify their system and um there was obviously political debate between the political left and the polit political right in the era where eugenics was common but they all agreed on the fact that you could sort of breed your way to the ideal society and that you could breed away inequalities if you just uh went on with it for for, for long enough and so i thought about system justification in today's context um which is where i kind of want to 
uh, get you guys to discuss with me or discuss with each other. Um, I want to connect the trade-off between equality and freedom, which is the essence of the chapter, pretty much. Yeah. Um, you try to disprove the fact that equality and freedom are mutually exclusive. And I want to connect that um, to the fact that um, we face massive environmental destruction today um, because, and that's why I mentioned the eugenics part, um, in the context of climate change facing our planet, we have people from the political left and the political right trying to justify driving factors of climate change by using equality and equity arguments. If we pay the fair price for meat, it has to become more expensive. You have people on the political left saying it's unfair that poor people get uh, worse access to uh, what we consider at least, you know, basic nutrition. Um, I also want to throw in um, a decision by the German Supreme Court as an answer to uh, a climate protection act that was passed in uh, well a couple of years ago. And the German Supreme Court said that um, the climate protection act by Merkel's party wasn't enough and sh it shifted too much um, too much responsibility for uh, the consequences of climate change to younger generations. And obviously there were a couple of you know technicalities and, and um, um, technical terms in the in uh, in their decision, but their main argument was based on freedom. Um, they said that virtually every freedom is potentially affected by these future emission reduction obligations because virtually all areas of human life are still associated with greenhouse gas emissions and thus at risk of drastic restrictions after 2030. What I'm onto here is, do we need, when we discuss the trade-off between freedom and equality, do we need a time dimension? Because freedom today means less freedom tomorrow. And <laughs> sort of equal access to what we consider basic commodities in today's highly, you know, um, highly complex industrial societies always has an environmental trade-off. So what I want to ask you is, do you think that uh, our freedoms today affect our freedoms tomorrow? And where does equality come in? Does everybody know what I'm onto here? <laughs> All right, let's go to the class. What are your reactions to my presentation and Benedict's take on So my the core hypothesis that I may want to, you know, if you if you boil it down, I'd say that equal access today may mean less freedom and less equality tomorrow. Do we need the time dimension in all that discussion about freedom and equality? Some may call it a hot take, some may mm -hmm. find it compelling. Can I ask a question on this? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm somewhere now a participant of this class. Yeah. Um, what would you, like, where would you put like an adequate time frame? What is adequate here? Yeah. Like, is it 250 years? Is it 100 years? Is it like generational? Because, like, so, like, and with which generation we put, like, a stop to your imagination. So, like, how long would you like put this time frame if you would like? So, if someone would place this idea on like a concrete time frame, non regarding the politics, they never ever act long term because they think in like election periods. So, yeah, like, uh, this also the thinking what would be the time frame? I mean, the, yeah. Adding to that, hasn't the time already passed? As in, uh, isn't climate change somewhat out of our hands already? That's probably that's probably 
material for three seminars. Of <laughs> um, he just summoned up my PhD research in one question. <laughs> um, we still have, we, as of now, I think, so for the discussion, let's take it as given this, that we have some sort of power to change, you know, to, to significantly change the outcomes of one main case of it. And that brings us to the time frame. There's tangible, tangible evidence that my grandchildren will see a vastly different planet with vastly different freedoms because of very simple resource conflicts. It my was, son may die in the water wars of 2018. <laughs> oh, regarding that, yes, they are right. That water, fresh water is a good investment because yeah. they're, yeah. <laughs> they're going to sell. There was a Bloomberg water. article about yeah, how water is an amazing we're not commodity. Getting if you want water, just like buy a farm enough. in California. And yeah. You know, well, be yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you have this discussion already in Europe. If you look at the big companies, if you look at, look at what like mm. is protested in France, like what Nestle did, like, I mean, they're already running out of water, it's all privatized, and like the state yeah. is taking it back now in France, which is like the counter movement of what is happening in Germany, where you have the movement still towards privatization, mm -hmm. which is like also part of this argument, like, yeah. basically, freedom, equality, and the capitalist market are all so intertwined by now, that like, where is like, where does one end? Where does the next start? Like, how do you actually separate these issues in a way that, like, if you think future oriented, that like a positive outcome is still possible? I mean, like, if you look at the statistics, most, if we stay with the climate change example, most um, emissions are like made by the big companies. It's not the individual person's footprint that, like, mostly affect like mm -hmm. the climate outcome of the world. Still, the way it is treated in the discourse is that it's played back to the individual person, especially in Europe. The discourse in, like, for example, Tanzania is way different. I mean, like, they have one of the strictest, like, plastic laws in the world. Like, you can't even bring a plastic bag, like, a one-way plastic bag into the country anymore, which is, like, a good thing, obviously. Yeah. Well, like, so, say... Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, Nate, okay, like, I think this is enough because, like, if I start now, it's going to have to be yeah. like Fabian. Sure. Fabian is a, a real anthropologist, I should say. I'm here presenting two books mm -hmm. largely about anthropology, but mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not an anthropologist. Yeah, I'm, I'm not asking all the anthropology questions. Yeah. Like that, mm -hmm. getting okay. Out of control. Uh, okay, next on the queue, I've got Marvin and then Medha, and then I think we'll probably move on. Yeah, um, I think it's a very nice point um, that you raised. And I would agree, I think um, it's just a matter of scope and whether we include future generations as an actor and just for, as a, from the viewpoint of an economist on the example of climate change, that's what we do in a economic analysis by a discount factor. Like for example, by choosing an infinity lift actor and then putting a discount rate on it. And I, I think it makes a lot of sense also intuitively that, um, as you said, like you probably don't have grandchildren yet, but um, you would include them in your decision process. Okay. Um, taking from what Fabian said about how capitalism, equality, and freedom are so intertwined, um, uh, aren't these big companies creating a mirage about what equality and freedom actually is? to deviate the attention from the harm that they bring to society, uh, which, uh, I don't know how to relate this in words, but which brings, uh, brings us back to the UBI debate, as in my generation especially, I see young people, they are so capitalist in their uh, way of approaching life, that uh, implementing universal basic income would be really hard. Like after the seminar, when I talk to my friends, most of them were like, oh, why should we pay for people who don't go to work or who don't... Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't know how to address that. Uh, I mean, that's what, is it the, 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 what you started with, this idea, you know, aren't they, they're controlling the rhetoric and obfuscating from, from uh, the truth. That, that's, the, that's the point of books like this. You know, this book and the last one is trying to show that 
that things that people have been trying to get us to take for granted for hundreds of years yeah. um, are simply false. And I got the facts to prove it. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on to the next section. Um, uh, this is interesting, but there's, there's a lot more to go to this book. We're only mm -hmm. on chapter four. Um, so here, on chapter five. Um, so these two, this I'll, I'll make this the smallest section uh, because I want to save time for the, the big one at the end. Um, now, now we're addressing the negative freedom and art, the negative freedom argument for the market economy. And we're addressing it with the negative freedom argument for the hunter-gatherer band economy. Um, in chapter five, we show how the negative freedom argument for the market economy is used, who uses it, and why. Um, and what you find is that there's always looking, there, there, the claim is that, that whatever the market does, it doesn't promote your welfare, it doesn't promote equality, but it gives you freedom in the sense of freedom is non-interference, that nobody interferes with what you're doing. Um, and that, uh, and most people who attack that will attack that by saying, well, freedom of interference isn't the most important kind of freedom. Well, that attack might work uh, for some areas, but then you're conceding this ground. You're saying that the people saying that we have to have unfettered capitalism with no taxation, regulation, or redistribution of property are right that that's an economy where we, uh, which is freest in the sense of not being interfered with. But when you look at the argument here, it's always the freedom of the property owner and in not looking at the fact that when you establish this thing as my property, what that is more than anything else is the right to interfere with somebody else who might want to use that thing. If this land is my land and this land is not your land, the one thing I can certainly tell you to do is you can't come on unless I say, I can interfere with you. It is a license to interfere. And that gives you, if you own the property, that gives you lots of freedoms. If you've got this land that nobody else can use unless you say so, there's a lot of things you can do on that land without interference. It does give you freedom for interference if you have property. If you don't have property, it interferes with you. Um, so a very small window of argument that they have to say even that this promotes freedom in a negative sense, in a meaningful one, not to say, oh, well, we just define freedom as, as, as exercising your rights to property. Well, that's just tautological and meaningless. Um, if they're saying that it actually is delivering more freedom from interference to most people, would have to be that well, it's just so easy to get the property that you need and, and the freedoms of living your life that come from that are so uh, are so great that it doesn't matter that some people start out with no freedom. Actually, over the course of their lives, they will have greater freedom from interference because they'll get the property they need to get free from interference. And so we look at that, but and and most people have been just comparing that with socialism, but counting every uh, every regulation socialism puts on the property owner and, and counting that as counting that as new unfreedoms and not counting the relieving the lower class from, from the unfreedoms that, that they have, they're making the wrong comparison. And nobody's looked at, well, if capital, if it's true that capitalism is the system that is more consistent with negative freedom than any other, you have to compare it to all systems. And so it'll look, well, who's ever compared it to banned societies? So again, we ban societies or immediate return societies, what, if, if, whether those are good names or not, those names are a bit controversial, but whatever you call people who live in these groupings, what you find is that there's almost a total, complete lack of interference with anything anybody wants to do. Um, as either political interference or economic interference with people uh, are not, you don't have bosses telling you what to do and you don't have public officials telling you what to do. You don't, often you don't even have parents telling kids what to do. Um, so Eleanor Leacock describes, she says, leadership as we conceive it is not merely weak, but irrelevant. Uh, Marvin Harris, um, says neither taxes, rent, nor tribute kept people from doing what they wanted to do. 
And even some propertarians have recognized this. Uh, uh, a man named uh, 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 propertarian is my, my word for property rights advocates who use this negative freedom argument. This guy, Thomas Mayer, wrote, uh, wrote an article called Hunter Gatherers, the Original Libertarians, where he credited their effective mo economic mobility, the fact that they said they could go out and hunt by themselves and never come back to this band or join a new band or, or whatever they wanted as long as that this effective economic ability made people very free. However, he didn't, he never seemed to care the fact that they had, they had this absence of private property. He never even looked at that. He, he seemed to see as, as, if do, as if dutiful people, once they started claiming property, they'd all just accept that. Well, people in societies with common property rights regimes do not easily accept somebody just saying, oh, this is private property, now you can't touch it. Um, so when you compare the freedom of people in these societies with the freedom of the least free people in market societies, the people with no property, you find that they're freer in terms of status freedom of, or, or what this mayor guy calls effective economic mobility. The power, what I define in the book we'll be discussing next week, freedom as the power to say no, to say that I don't need to follow somebody's orders to survive and to live my life. In a society with a common property rights regime, whether you're a hunter-gatherer or whether you're a fisher, uh, whether you're a fisher or whether you're a farmer, if, if you have a common property regime, so you have direct access to the land, you do not need a boss, you don't need when going into work has nothing to do with going and, and following a boss's orders or following a client's directives. That's what work is today. And many of us are born in a situation where we will never save our way out of this position. We are condemned to follow someone else's hours, someone else's, someone else's orders for, for 50 weeks a year maybe less than Europe, 48 weeks a year, 40 years of our lives, uh, 40 hours a week, um, following orders. That is not in any meaningful sense freedom from interference. Somebody else interferes with your access to the resources and then gains control, not only over the resources, but over you. You also find in these societies much more political freedom, freedom to decide what laws you and your neighbors will live under, most of us are so far from the centers of power today, we don't feel we have any real freedom. You get, tend to get greater sexual freedom, gender freedom, and group-based freedom, and just negative freedom in general. Now, this has important implications for how we run our society today. If we're going to get rid of the commons without making people unfree, if your goal really is delivering people Freedom is non-interference, which are the friends of the market always say they want. You have to compensate the people who lose out in some way that is going to preserve this type of freedom, where they to restore this power to say no, where I don't have to follow your word, your rules if I don't want to. And this, uh, this then I connect to an argument for universal basic income high enough to ensure that you have the power to say no to anybody who would want to boss you around. And if you go in, if you go into a job and take orders, it is not because that's the only way to make a living, but because you've chosen to in order to get luxuries. Then it's then it's not so much an infringement on your freedom if it's if you're able to choose whether or not to follow it. All right, that's that section of the book in a very brief summary. Oh, good, we're catching up on some time. All right, I'll take it over to uh, Benedict to just get the discussion started. All right. Um, so um, I found parts of the parts of the chapter really compelling, um, and I want to start out with um, well, the gist of well, sort of the the essence of the argument, and that is that we should remind ourselves just how coercive our capitalist everyday life really is. We face coercion in so many ways. And I mean, the liberty and freedom discourse may be stronger, a lot stronger uh, ideologically in the US. Um, it's still sort of a talking point uh, 
in Germany and I would say in Central Europe. Um, feel free to disagree with me on that. If you're from you know, a different continent, you say, hey, um, this is not the case in my country of origin. Um, but for example, in our current government in Germany, that was pretty, well, that was elected last September. We have a party that's um, running on a classical liberal platform that claims to be liberal, not only economically, but um, you know, in a sort of social way as well. But some of their policies have very, very, very coercive consequences. And I think we should always remind ourselves of the fact that, you know, there is not as much liberty as we like to, you know, believe in and that as much as we, um, and we're also sort of, you know, there is some ideological grooming going on when it comes to the talking point of liberty. That being said, um, um, the gist of what I, I got from the chapter is that you criticize proprietarians for sort of mis-selling the ideology. Um, because of all the coercion going on, as soon as they, uh, you know, you sort of confront them, they say um, that um, their ideology provides opportunity. I think that's, that, that's what was written in the book. Um, can I add something to that? Yeah. Or should I wait for you to finish? Um, no, go ahead. <laughs> no worries. So I can give the example of my country. Six years ago, we elected a right-wing government, and uh, it's like it goes parallelly. The right-wing ideology uh, multiplies each given year, and so does the capitalist uh, market structure which is in place in India. And when you question the ideology, like you said. When you question the ideology, people say, oh, but the government is providing us jobs in the capitalist sector. Um, but what people do not understand is, is that these jobs come um, with decreased freedom, uh, as in, in your personal lives, um, decreased freedom. There are work mails you receive even two in the night. There are meager wages. But then just to say that you have a job, uh, they consider it fine. Yeah. I also want to say that. Uh... One of the implications I didn't, didn't talk about is it, when, when, when you look at this comparison between the market economy and, and uh, stateless, small scale nomadic stateless societies, you find that uh, when people are unfree with that, that makes us question the comparisons we've been doing among our society because they will make this claim that when you tax this person to redistribute to that person, you are sacrificing this person's freedom to help this person's welfare. And they'll say it's never worth it helping somebody's welfare uh, at, at the sacrifice of freedom. But in fact, this person whose, whose welfare you're helping is in fact very unfree and you are extending their freedom from interference. The interference that the establishment of this private property rights system has imposed on them against their will. So you're actually promoting freedom when you take from rich and give to the poor. When you consider where, when you consider the types of interference that the poor are subject to. Okay, uh, Dritan, you had your, you had your hand up. Okay, thank you. Uh... Well, I, I, I don't genuinely think that we are extending and promoting freedom if we look at it from an individual perspective. Uh, when you look at it from a collective perspective or a societal perspective, it might be the case. But if you tax me, for, for instance, uh, simply because I earn more uh, in the name of uh, extending freedom to somebody else, by providing that, by redistributing that income, uh, we, we are looking at it from a collective perspective and not, a, not from an individual perspective, because that tax uh, uh, negatively discriminates me and positively discriminates somebody else. So it, it's some kind of, um, uh, you know, the ut utilitarian approach of. Uh, of uh, how do you call it? Uh, I mean, uh, 
you're basically not promoting individual freedom. Maybe you you are uh, providing the society at a better position in general, but but you're not uh, but you're not helping individuals. And uh, to say to say more about it, if I earn more and you tax me, well, actually, I I already pay more in taxes. You know, if I get ten thousand euros and I'm I, I will I will pay less than somebody who gets uh, 100, 100,000 euros. So the sum the amount that, that somebody pays is 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 already more than than somebody who earns less. And actually, uh, um, it interferes with, with someone's individual liberty. No. Um... Okay, uh, I can see that I haven't made the arguments in these two chapters clear to you. Um, it was a very quick presentation, but I clearly that they're not clear to you because you don't really seem to understand what I'm saying. Um, I'm talking about individual freedom, freedom of specific individual people, and I'm talking about actually the the system you're advocating, the system is, or you know, at least you're advocating here for the sake of argument, right? Is one that positively discriminates against some, uh, positively discriminates in favor of some, and negatively discriminates against the freedom of other people. When you divide the land into so-called private property, as if people had a real right to this, you divide the land, the government makes rules to say, you get this, you drip time, get this, and, and, uh, and uh, Marvin over there gets nothing. Uh, then you, Driton, are interfering with Marvin for your own welfare. So you get to have all this extra stuff. You're interfering with the use that Marvin might make of those resources to the earth. You have made him less free. And if you're doing that with this land, and he's doing that with that land, and she's doing that with that, so there's no land or other resources left. So then, then Marvin has nowhere to go, nowhere to sleep, unless he pays rent to one of one of y'all people. And the only way you can pay rent to one of y'all people is to work for one of your people. You have interfered with him in a way that not only gives you power over the property that you control and he doesn't, but in turn, you're leveraging that control over your property to control over Marvin. He has to do what he tells you because if he tries to do things on his own, as he is able to do with the resources of the earth, you will interfere with him. You're harming his negative freedom for your own benefit. So we have a society where some own property and others don't. What we have is a society that is based on positive discrimination toward the property owners by interfering with everybody else in order to create these privileges that we call rights and property. Okay, um, you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, it kind of relates to where I was going with the with the discussion, anyways. Of what Dritton said. So, um, so uh, to pick up where I left off, you say that um, as soon as you confront proprietarians with um, the, you know the fact that um, there's a lot of coercion in their system, they promote opportunity. Then, if you want to make opportunity happen, uh, for example, by redistribution. Um, they go back to the old don't interfere with me sort of um, arguments. Um, while I generally agree, I say, and that relates to Britain's point, that different proprietarian societies have different attitudes towards the grid distribution and where should we interfere and where shouldn't we. Um, I, for one, can say that Germany loves to redistribute income. Uh, we have a, a very high marginal uh, income tax. But uh, Germany almost doesn't redistribute land and wealth and inheritances, which is sort of the foundations of why we are more oligarchic than one would think. Um, which again relates to the fact that, you know, from an individual standpoint, I'm going to inherit the five bedroom apartment my mom owns. <laughs> from an individual standpoint, I didn't do anything for it. Um, so if you only look at individuals in a society, obviously you're going to, you know, you're going to run into difficulties sooner or later. Um, so from a justice standpoint, do I deserve that apartment? I didn't do shit for it. So uh, anyways, uh, that's sort of, yeah, I was isn't sort of going in that direction. Sorry. Isn't that, um, I don't know if you know about the three justice maxims 
the Rockefeller Branson problem? No, I, I'm not familiar. So the so there are three main uh, rules of justice. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the names exactly, but one of the uh, the third uh, problem, uh, the third maxim is the Rockefeller Branson problem, which says uh, Rockefeller was a man who was very wealthy, and his grandson inherits everything. So is that justice? Um, if 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 Britain inherits everything, is that social justice? Mm -hmm. It's not, right? And then someone's uh, grandfather or father does not own anything, so that person does not inherit anything. So it will be sort of an injustice to that person if he does not have a land or a house of his own. And that's where and that's where the debates like UBI or reservations for the poor or um, I sort of to say social security comes into place to redistribute that kind of inheritance so that uh, we have more equality in the society. Okay, now let's let Britton get the last word in and uh, then go to a break. Okay, Britton. Okay, thank you. Uh, I heard Marvin uh, actually made a good point earlier when he mentioned that in econ from an economics perspective, we in our economic models, we include infinitely lived agents. In, in, in some way or another, we are thinking of uh, our sons, our uh, daughters, or our children, and probably grandsons. And wouldn't, um, I mean, inheritance is actually a good thing. And if, and if it didn't exist, wouldn't it uh, disincentivize uh, people not to work? Uh, it, it kind of serves accumulation of wealth uh, kind of serves as a stimulus as a stimulus for somebody who's ambitious and wants to work and have a good life and probably um, uh, inherit uh, probably give it to, to uh, his dearest people which are their children so if that didn't exist and if if, if it wouldn't be just uh, I would think that it kind of uh, you know, disincentivize people not to work and not to uh, accumulate wealth. Isn't that cool? Oh. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so let's take a five minute break. Uh, all I'm saying, uh, I'm sorry. All I'm saying is that if Benedict uh, inherits uh, his mother's apartment, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. right. I mean, I think it's cool. um, so, um, uh, let's take a five minute break and meet back here at uh, 423. Uh, so, uh, yeah. and then we'll start the next section of the book. Okay, welcome back. So, now we move on to the third and largest part of the book, um, uh, where we talk about the individual appropriation hypothesis or the claim that there is something natural about the right to private property. Um, so I discuss in chapters seven through nine, a pretty substantial part, takes three chapters to do this. I discuss the meaning of this theory and I, I, what, what these theories are trying to say. You have these theories where since John Locke, people have been saying, somebody goes out in the woods, chops the trees down and makes it his property increases the value of the land much more than it was before, and therefore it's, it's his land. And Locke even says he doesn't say that's what actually happened, but why does he tell this story? Why are we telling this myth of the original appropriator and then saying it does not, uh, it, it doesn't matter? Why do we keep making, and you find this story being told over and over again from then to the present day, and then people say, well, you know, it didn't happen that way, whatever. Um, what they're trying to say is what we look at, what dissecting their arguments and what they're trying to say is that private property develops naturally. If you leave people free from interference, what they're going to do is to create this institution. We don't have this institution in all times and places because powerful people come and interfere with the people who are doing this. But, if you, if, but what people really will do if you give them the chance, what they want to do and what they need 
to live their lives free from interference is to create this institution of individual private property where one person has domain over the land and gets to decide pretty much everything that happens this land at this land or anything we make out of it and can exclude everyone else from it. Uh, and there's, of course, the corollary to that is that co common, collective, and public property does not develop naturally the way private property does. Those things can only be created. We only have group rights, like a nation or an ethnic group or a people. They can only have rights over the land. They can only establish those rights by interfering with individuals who are trying to create these individual private rights. Common rights must come by interfering with them. If this is true, if this is true, then history should show constantly thwarted attempts of people trying to establish private property rights and violent disappropriation of private property holders by people trying to establish government property rights, common property rights, collective property rights, ethnic group held property rights, all of anything like that would have to be would, would constantly be being established by violence, whereas individual property being established by individuals if and when they're free from interference. Uh, so we should see that the first people to claim, use, or occupy or mix their labor with land, which are the different criteria people give for appropriation, those people would tend, uh, tend to establish or always establish individual property rights if this claim that there's something natural about this institution is true. So we go through, that's, that's three chapters we go through to get to that, to get to this claim and what's, what they're trying to say in this natural rights justification for property and what testable empirical claims are there within this argument. Then um, we look at evidence provided by propertarians for this hypothesis. And what you find is that most of them have no citations at all. They just take it for granted that this is what they're going to do. Those who do have a citation to any sort of empirical evidence almost always cite a very short passage by Friedrich Hayek or Hayek. Um, and uh, Hayek has three sources. Hayek has three sources, and none of them back him up. He overinterprets all three of those sources. Um, we have a couple of others who looked at it. We have a, a man called Hasnas who's uh, looking at a, a empirical natural rights, but actually would not. He's only looking at a way to do it. He's not actually looking at a lot of empirics. And a man called Stake or Sock Stocking, uh, who looks at animal territoriality, but extremely selectively choosing the animals that have more territory and not looking at animals such as herding animals or our closest relatives, other primates, and what kind of property rights they have. So what we find is that they're making this strong claim about what it is that people do when they're interfree, free, free from interference. And then they're really uninterested in any evidence to see whether this is really what people do when they're free from interference. So lack of evidence, a lack of even interest in evidence. So what we do then is we go through, we go through the history or the prehistory of private properties, we call it the time before the private property rights system was put into place and look at how it got to be the way it was. There was a time before we had a private property rights system. We can say confidently that 10 or 20,000 years ago, there was no private property. No land was owned by a person in the world. Uh, and now almost the entire world is owned. It's either owned by governments or it is owned by private people and institutions. How did this happen? What existed before? And do these observations back up this claim 
that that establishing property rights is what people do when they're free from energy. And that establishing collective rights involves interference with people who are trying to do this. So we start out with hunter-gatherer societies. Um, uh, again, looking at hunter-gatherer bands, which is the smallest, the smallest least uh, uh, with the smallest, uh, uh, loosest groupings of, of humans that we know of. Uh, and what, from archaeological evidence and the beliefs of anthropologists, the, the contemporary societies who probably have existed the longest, uh, people have always been capable of creating different kinds of societies, but in a world of, of, uh, abundant game as there was for most of human history. Um, it was very possible for people to just be nomadic hunters and hunt, well, uh, nomadic hunters for uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. And that's what, from the archeological evidence, that's what it seems that most people were doing during the first two or 300,000 years that humans were on this planet. Um, and for most of the preceding seven million years when hominins were, were, were making us more and more different than, than other ape species. Um, so um, we look at land tenure systems among hunter-gatherers, and what we find is that no, uh, and we and we and what we find is that they have a common property regime that overwhelmingly. Nomadic hunter-gatherers, not the settled hunter-gatherers might be different, but nomadic hunter-gatherers will not have private property. To the extent that they have property at all, it adheres to the entire group, not to any one person. And it is not, they do not have an interest in the property that they can sell if they go over and move with the next band. But even then, it is not, it is, it is quite loose. If um, what they tend to have is not to say that this land belongs to this group and that land belongs to that group, but this group tends to live here and that group tends to live over there. Uh, there will occasionally be fights over where we can be, but very often you have somebody coming in, okay, we're getting into an area that you mostly forage in. You mind if we forage here? And if the other side says no, they're very likely to invite a conflict. In that sort of a world, there really is no recognized right of property. We have a common property regime. The question then is, are nomadic hunter-gatherers, uh, can we look at them as, as original appropriators? Um, well, uh, they certainly do not establish, uh, they do some of the things that appropriators are supposed to do. They claim land, they use land, which is some of the criteria people put for appropriation. Um, and many hunter-gatherers have also mixed their labor with the land by saying, killing off all of, all of the uh, saber-toothed tiger uh, or, the, uh, or the cave bear in an area, ridding it of a predator. Whether that's wise or not is, is, is another question. But the question whether that is mixing your labor with the land in a significant way, it certainly is. Um, so they do the kind of thing that original appropriators do, and they establish private property neither in land, as I've already mentioned, nor in movable tools. Um, movable tools tend to be, as I mentioned before, subject to demand sharing. You've got two spears, somebody else doesn't have one, you can't really camp with that band anymore if you're not going to give them your extra spear. If you've got a spear, you have one spear, but you're not using it today, uh, and you're not using it today, somebody else wants it, you got to give it to them or you're going to be ridiculed and maybe eventually has to leave that bank. Um, so uh, they have neither property in goods nor, uh, nor movable tools. Uh, then, then we look at stateless farming communities. And these are the original farmers. We know that this type of farming goes back longer than any other type you know and that is what people tend to do it's called swing agriculture or slash and burn agriculture people will go to an area clear the trees 
burn the trees and the ashes of the trees then will create sort of fertilizer. They will farm this area until the land begins to get depleted. Then they will go to another area and let this land return to its natural state. And they repeat this over and over again. Uh, so they're, they're, um, they're not necessarily what you call nomadic, but they, uh, but they, um, they do move every few years. The, now, farmers are important because since long, proprietarians have been pointing to farmers as the original appropriate. They are the ones who first very clearly mix their labor with the land, very clearly make claims to it. These farmers, uh, these, uh, uh, so the claim, uh, but what you find then is these first farmers will do, they do what Locke says, and that is create private plots of land. And overwhelmingly in groups like this, I don't think you can find a single group like this that actually does create individual private property. That, that, or, or so much in movable goods and things, that they will clear the land together, they will work it together, they, they, they might work it individually, but they're not entitled to keep their plot. One year you're working here, another year, uh, even within the villas that you cleared, you're spending say five years at this site, one year you're farming here, another year you're farming there, another year you're farming there within the villa. Uh, there is no, uh, there is no idea that this land is mine, but me as a member of this group is entitled to a share. Somebody who comes and joins the group, somebody who comes and joins the group then gets a share the next season. And somebody who leaves the group does not sell out his share, he just simply leaves. There's no ownership in this sort of thing. Um, and even then, now there might, there would be though more ownership of, of the things people produce on the land, but not as strict as we have. Um, uh, it tends to be, it tends to be that, um, it tends to be that um, people will, how should, how should I put it? Um, is that uh, that people will consume what they what they produce themselves unless someone is in need, and then there's an obligation of everyone else to get. If you, so those are the type of things that these candidates to be our original appropriator decide. Something really not at all like uh, like the individualist private property that Locke just all the first farmers would just naturally want to do. Um, and this was, you know, somebody who was also writing about, he was hearing colonial reports and really ignored what the native farmers were doing as he was only concerned with what the settler farmers were doing, the white people. He was concerned only with them, but those were people who were already acculturated and a part of a much larger system where they could sell goods. Uh, that's not what the first people had tended to do. Now, and this kind of agricultural system where you as a member of the group have a claim to, to use some land, but not really to own land, is something that carries over very close in the modern day in different forms, even among groups that are no longer using slash and burn out agriculture, but are in the same place and they're keeping animals in various fields in order to re uh, in order to refertilize them. Uh, these groups will also tend not to have individual property in the land. And what you get is in these groups, they're not as anarchistic as, as the Swing agriculturalists as they, but they often get a chief or a lord or a king who lords over them, but the but the village is very much the same sort of collective. Property. Um, now, in by the time you get to uh, uh, by the time you get to the earliest the early states Mesopotamia Egypt uh, 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 
uh, Shang China and so forth. Um, well, actually, it's quite a bit before Shang China when you get so. But you get you get land tenure systems in these places that are neither neither are those neither are those private. In Egypt and Mesopotamia, what you had was really large scale agricultural uh, uh, irrigation projects uh, to support agriculture. And those irrigation projects were would tend to be coordinated from the center by the pharaoh or the kings or whatever you want to call them. And the um, it was a top down system with really very little private property very little private property at all at first. And the development of privatization in the ancient world does not begin with the people at the low level. You get in some areas, you got these big hydraulic agricultural products where they're irrigating the land and these are run very top down. You still get, you get these village agricultural settings that I've already described with the parasitic government put around on top saying you got to give us these taxes but otherwise you run yourself you get those kind of agriculture nothing really private at all there is no original individual private property owner for the king to disappropriate the people the king is disappropriating are these village people and hunter gatherers people who are using property in a common manner not in the individual private when you do get private property, it begins from the palace down. The king establishes, this is my palace, my own. It's not just me representing the people here in the palace. It might be that way at the temple over here or in the irrigation over there. I run that for the people. The palace is mine as an individual. And then the king has a palace. Well, maybe the king's brother is going to want a palace. Or he has three sons. Maybe they're all going to get a it, be, it filters down from the top and it is still pretty rare until until the classical period you get Greece and Rome these things get to be a little more common but even in Greece and Rome the original appropriators in Rome are not people who just went out in the wilderness and farmed they are the original the original appropriators, the original in the people who are awarded with individual private property tend to be military commanders who have gone and conquered territory, very often territory of people who are practicing much more collective as common institutions of property, took that land over. And then the government says, as a reward for your service, oh great general, we will give you this land as your private dominion. And that's where we get dominion, which comes down to us today as private property. This idea of having full control over this land. It begins there. But even then, so that gets us to the Roman period. And this is, of course, in much, much more detail in the book. Um, if you like reading history, you want to see the story of a long story of how property is developing, uh, read these seven chapters of the book. And in the cusp of the modern era, in the 13 and 1400s, when you have Europe is poised to begin its colonial movement, most of the world is still living in a village agricultural setting. Some are also still nomadic hunter gatherers, some are settled hunter gatherers, which I haven't really talked about around the world. That is a vast majority of people. You have a private dominium system. Only in the cities and pretty much only in Europe, it's still very top down in India and China and in the Inca Empire and, and, uh, and the Aztec Empire, places like that. It's still very top down. It's really only in the cities in Europe in the 13 and 1400s where you have something that we would recognize as individual private property. In the rural areas, you have this. You have the village agriculture with a government appointed lord on top and a, the dukes and earls and kings on top of him. It's still this system. The individual private property owner is not there. 
what, but between then, between the 1400s and today, it has become ubiquitous. And this is thanks mostly to two well-known historical movements, the enclosure movement in Europe and the colonial movement outside of Europe. In, within Europe, enclosures began, some say as early as the 12 or 1300s, but in a big way, especially in England in the 1400s, where the Lord who was presiding over people with common rights to the land in, in villages, the Lord would say, well, these people are really just tenants. And their rights to the land aren't really rights, go to tradition. And that's really not so important. What's important is that I own this, own this land. That God, God, I'm a landlord, which is more of a private term. I want to be the private owner of this land. And then I want to have the right to make my to, to kick my tenants off. Okay, yeah, they've been working this land for thousands of years, but I want to kick them off because I want dominion over this land. And parliament. And the king let them do it a little at a time, a little at a time. And this enclosure movement in England takes the, the bulk of it is not complete until the 1700s, and there's still vestiges of it oh, well into the 1800s when they're still doing more enclosures. That mainly starts in England, but it spreads around Europe. It is not complete. It is not complete in Russia when you have the when you have a Russian revolution, and it was actually the communists who finished it. The communists, rather than what their so called collectivization, was actually creating a top down hierarchy where you've got where you've got a manager on top that can give orders to everybody else in their daily lives and stuff like that, really mimicking the private property system in the West and what had been a a very communal system that you would think communists would have liked, but they really actually, what they really like is top down stuff. That's how it spreads throughout Europe. Throughout the rest of the world, it, this institution is spread by European colonialism. Europeans, much like the Romans, their Roman ancestors, go and conquer territory all over the world, and they award settlers by taking land from private people who are practicing these more common communal institutions and saying, we're going to make this private dominion. We're going to interfere with you. We're going to force you to drive to create this private property system. And then that happens gradually over the world. It is not necessarily complete when independence starts happening and, 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 and colonialists, and sorry, people in the colonies Throw off their colonial masters and become and become uh, independent governments again. Even then, you find these governments completing the job in the areas that were remote enough to been escaped by the colonials, because the governments have become part of the international capitalist system, and they are forcing this institution to be adopted to be adopted even after their their independence. And that is how we got the private property. Uh, that is how we got the private property system. So then to assess this individual appropriation hypothesis, it is simply disproven. We do not see continually thwarted attempts of people trying to establish individual private property whenever they're free from interference. We see very much the opposite. People who are free from interference tend to set up communal, common access to land. That if you are a member of this community, you have a right to land, you cannot sell it, you cannot buy it, you have it for you, one of them. Uh, that is what people tend to do when they're free from interference. And we get an individual private property rights system when you have an insider government that wants to favor people, such as generals, and say, we want to take this land and give it all to this guy. That is how the private property system developed. It was a long and slow and several hundred years of worldwide campaign of violent interference. That's how we got this system. Uh, 
So the first people to discover, use, claim, occupy, or mix their labor with resources over the most of the earth established complex, overlapping, flexible, non-spatial, partly collective and uh, land tenure systems with significant common elements, something nothing like the dominion system that we have today. The establishment of private property systems necessarily involve coercion, violence, and disappropriation of people who are practicing these more common communal collectivist systems. The people and the community have, in fact, a better claim to the land and resource ownership than, uh, than the unequal private property holders whose claim traces back to government. That's the story there. The implications, of course, for UBI and other things is that people are due compensation. Uh, all right, so let's turn it over to, uh, 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 who's the discussion on this one? Andrea? Andrea yeah. Okay, Andrea. so it's pronounced Andrea. Andrea, yeah. Andrea, okay. Okay, Andrea, uh, your comment. Yeah, so, I won't really get too much into what you already explained. I mean, I think you already told us the roots of property ownership and the obvious lack of evidence that it is a natural thing. I mean, I can I can understand why it's not natural to just own something. But then when I was reading your book, I was like, I had kind of like a discussion with myself. Because on one side, I think it, it's obvious that it creates a lot of inequality in people, just like we were saying, I mean, if you inherit something from your mom, you're born with an advantage from others just by property ownership. So I don't think that's fair to others because um, you didn't do anything and, and you're born with this power to control or even exploit others to labor and stuff just because your parents or your family did something else. But um, I think like, how can we stop people from excessive property ownership? Should we go back to these, like the agricultural machine that you were talking about and no one owns anything, but like you just lose use land whenever you need it. But then I was like, okay, if we do that, how can we make sure that everyone will get a piece of land to work when they need it? Does, don't we need someone to own this land to make sure that everyone gets a piece of it. So that's when I started thinking, how can we make sure that everyone has land to use without having an excess of property ownership with like within each individual? So I thought of limitations, not purely eliminating property ownership, but limiting the amount of property someone can have. So we make sure, I mean, I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but um, it may, this way we can make sure that everyone has a part of it. It's really different, I mean, difficult, um, because usually the owner will be a government or like, I don't know, the chief or someone. And if this government is corrupted, then of course, there will be advantages for others. But I think also not having property ownership will lead to uh, people taking advantage either way, or like maybe one person won't be able to get something whenever they want to. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm, yeah, that was my only question. Like, wouldn't be better, uh, be better if we find like a middle point of that? Is it possible to have like a limitation of property ownership does it make sense? I don't know what you guys think. Okay. Okay, so let me open up the floor. Okay, we have Dritan. Dritan is good at, at speaking. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Let's follow Dritan's example, you know? Um, it, it's not hard. It's just like, um, somebody say something, you have an opinion on it, just speak it up. You know, it's just uh, don't don't worry that yeah, maybe my opinion isn't well thought out enough or whatever. Just say your opinion, you know. We get the discussion going, we get the ideas out there. Okay, Britta, thanks. 
Uh, thank you. I think the uh, solution to Andrea's question is a circular economy, where uh, consumption uh, production uh, is recycled and uh, there isn't any property rights in, in that case. So basically, if you want to use a lamp, for instance, you basically rent it. So you, you don't own it, but you rent it. And whoever needs one, when you want to uh, you know, replace that. You will, you will, you will lease that to somebody else. You will, uh, you will, they will recycle it. Uh, that will, that lamp will be recycled, and 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 in this uh, sense, a cycle is uh, is produced and is put in place. So uh, in that way, I guess uh, everybody could have uh, uh, what what he or she needs, uh, and whenever he or she needs. So yeah, that that was that's that's my two cents in this in Andrea's question. Um, no, 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 yeah, oh, right. yeah, I got to look here and there. Um, I wonder if it would make sense. It's kind of it seems kind of silly, but if in the future, like the people who are present, actually brought a computer and, and put your and and, and and got in the meeting so that we saw your face on the meeting. Because what, what we have here, of course, is all these squares for the meeting, and uh, and <laughs> if we had like you know two more squares than usual, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. But anyway, Matt. Um, the very simple question: What if we have scarcity? Yeah. Then what happens? Well, um, uh, what happens in my system? Well, my, my system is not uh, uh, is is not saying that we have to put people back. Is that um, we have interfered with people, and in a way, we've created a system that has made, uh, ha has, has put 7 billion people on the planet going on. Hey, uh, and the system we've created has created a bunch of scarcity and a huge demand on our resources. The solution is that is not necessarily just give everybody back direct access to the land, but to compensate them for what they've lost. And what they've lost is their freedom. And you have direct access to land and you know how to use it as, as many of your ancestors and mine did. Every single one of us has ancestors who are subsistence farmers. We have every single one of us has many, many ancestors who were hunter gatherers. And they were all experts at how to live off the land. When you have that, they were also, these ancestors of yours and mine were self-directed and didn't have to knuckle under their power structures. How can we compensate them for that in a way that preserves that freedom? And that's what gets me to universal basic income. Say, okay, you're going to take away my direct access to the land. You give me, you give me enough money that I can live on plus a little extra for my trouble. And then if you want me to work for you, you offer me, you offer me more. You offer me some luxuries. Got my basics and a little extra because of all you've imposed on me. I live off this minimum. I'm using less resources than everybody else because everybody else gets more. If I work, I get more. If I don't work, I get less. I get the least, but I got enough. So if you want me to work for you, give me a good offer. That's the kind of institution that I'm proposing. That's a universal basic income pitch to high level. Uh, so the point that you make that most of our ancestors were uh, subsistence, subsistence farmers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an interesting thing that I I pay attention to uh, that I got attracted to when I came here um, in Tribal is that Tribal claims to be a green city, yeah. but no one will grow vegetables in the huge lawns, <laughs> and there is nothing but grass. Right? Yeah. So something something so. If you could grow something in your garden, and then the government would introduce something like, okay, if you are growing um, fruits or suppose vegetables in your garden, then we give you a little bit of tax subsidy because then you don't buy from the market much. That's it. Yeah. I think German in the room, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't that the early 2000 concept for putting solar panels on your roof? Yes, it was. 
Oh, so like, I mean, you have an urban farming movement that exists. Yeah. It's just not as visible. Like, it is there in Europe. It's a thing. Mm. I mean, it's not subsidized, but like, yeah, but endless potential. So many and, but we just <laughs> so many lawns. Yeah. I, I mean, just go to Bobon. Like, people grow vegetables on their balconies, and the balconies yeah. look like they're going to fall off. Exactly. Because yeah. where I live, I live, uh, I live in Leyland Field, and people have fairly big houses there. As in, they have huge lawns, so which yeah. have nothing, yeah. nothing. I understand the cold and everything else, the climate factor, but it, there could be more ways to make that land more productive. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got like four more, uh, four more families living on, on on top of me, so I feel like I'm making a very good use of land. Uh, <laughs> uh, others, want to talk? Okay, and I wanted just to add something. So um, we have kind of a new president in Mexico. And what he did was like, he realized a lot of people, most of the people from Mexico don't know any type of land. Like they don't have a house, they don't have anything. And so he proposed this limitation and he was like, no people should have more than two properties. So everyone started freaking out because most of the people have land, inherited land. I mean, not most of the people, but a lot of people inherited land. land. And of course, the rich people, which are very few, very low percent in Mexico, they have tons and tons of houses and a lot of property, right? They're just exploiting and like making money out of the people who actually need a place to live. So this president what proposed this idea of limitation. And of course, it will not benefit everyone but then we go into the part like what is fair a lot of people don't have a house and they must pay rent and everything and, and these people rich people because they inherited and you know their ancestors worked for it and blah 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 they don't want to give up on anything but then you have house and um, people with no homes so should we should the president make the rich people share, will that be fair for them? And if he doesn't make them share, will it be fair for the other people not to have a home? So it's like, I think this property ownership and everything is really hard to understand. That's why I also say like, will limitation actually work? This law didn't pass because of course the, the rich people, um, they have a lot of influence in, in politics. So it didn't pass, but then I was like, maybe it doesn't sound that unfair for some people. And rich people at the end won't be homeless. So I don't know. It's just something I wanted to share. Okay. Any responses? Oh, better. Um, so this just came up. <laughs> so, um, so in in Germany, where housing is definitely also an issue, but not, you know, with the, with, so there are no, so obviously there are no, or close to no slums in Germany. Obviously, you know, housing manifests differently, I guess, compared to Mexico. Um, what we all, what we face here is that um, it's mostly a, it's a mixture of demographic, different demographics and um, well, sort of urban areas growing and growing we have an average you know on average people live have a larger footprint even in urban areas where density is really high compared to i don't know the 1960s so where in even even in in countries where like it's it, the distribution seems more equitable you get a whole other you know plethora of issues i guess when it comes to when it comes to housing, the, in 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 German urban areas, nobody could live as a subsistence farmer, um, and so I, I don't. And redistribution would it would it really would 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 redistribution really solve that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, when we talk about rich people owning property, wouldn't uh, 
the rich also own productive resources. So wouldn't they say that, oh, my resources or my company contributes so much to the country's GDP. So I sort of have a right to own all these properties. Wouldn't that be a problem? Well, the, uh, the, that we, well, you, you do something, you play by the rules, and uh, you know you, you win under those rules. I think you certainly, uh, and, and when you're doing something useful for other people, I think you, you certainly think you should get something. But what uh, owners claim in an unfettered society is not just what they have done. As a matter of fact, the big money is not in our society, it's not the people who do stuff. The big money is the people who own stuff. If you have a great entrepreneurial idea that takes neat seed money, the person with that gets that seed money is very often you don't want to make most of it up, most of it. Um, uh, they're, they're, um, the heir to the the heir to the L'Oreal fortune. Made eight billion dollars in the same span that that uh, Steve Jobs created Apple computers and made the same eight billion dollars. All the all the air did was own something that went up in value. And now Steve Jobs' children have made and his other heirs have made more money than he ever did. It has gone up more than after his life than him. Um, but even then, the the Steve Jobs didn't create the company by himself. Um, he created it with the workers who work for less than they might otherwise have, have charged if they had been freer to say, no, I don't want to work here. Uh, I, I can live on my own. Um, but also they take advantage of past technologies. Um, past technologies for providing them free, past efforts of past people, as if they all all of these things. And one thing that they are all doing is that they're not just, their wealth is not just made out of things people do, but it's made out of natural resources. And wealthy people are putting a bigger demand on the resources of the earth than everyone else. Whatever nice things they do, they are taking up more land, they are polluting our atmosphere more, they're polluting our groundwater more, they're, they're, they're polluting our ground more. Um, they're using, controlling, and using up resources in a way, as I said before, that gives them leverage over the lives of other people. Um, and we can get them to do their nice things, the things that they do that are good for us, like building Apple computers. We can get them to do that and give them plenty of incentive to do that and have them compensate everybody else for the extra demands they put on resources and for the things that they get from things like past technologies. Uh, you, know, who, uh, you know, who invented the internet was the, the US Defense Department. Imagine if we all had, had to pay, uh, uh, how, what, how terrible the world would be if we all paid a royalty to the Defense Department um, every time we use the internet, had they, had they um, patented it in a certain way and tried to make money off the idea. Instead, that money is going to Amazon and Apple and Google and, and Facebook and the other big internet firms. They get that money, which could just as well belong to the people as a whole, money that was funded by the people as a whole. So what I'm asking is, 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 is to compensate people who have less access to resources by the people who have more access to resources enough that they can live on that and live decently on that. Then what you get, if you're a net recipient of the system, that's your reward for using less resources than everybody else. If you're a net payer, that's your fee. Okay, you know, you built, you built Amazon.com. Yeah, you get more than everybody else, but you're gonna pay for those resources they use. And when we, when we pay that, and we use free workers from the dependence on the job, that means, you are going to have to bargain a little harder to get employees and end up paying them. That's what I'm envisioning. And we've kind of moved on to solutions. So, you know, I've said so in, so I'll bring, so I'm getting to the, so I'll get to your question, but 
uh, or your comment. Uh, so I'm going on to the last chapter of the book when I talk about where I talk about solutions to, the, to what implications that we've got. First, the claim that inequality is impossible is false. The claim that inequality comes with a sacrifice, of, necessarily comes with a sacrifice of freedom is false. The claim that a uh, very unequal private property rights system uh, is freer than every other system is false. And it, the people who are made least free of, of, of it are identifiable. And with compensation, we can restore some of their freedom. And finally, the idea that there's anything natural in a private right to property is not true too. So that private property rights then are something society creates. And if we're gonna create that, it's gotta be something that is going to enhance everyone's freedom and benefit everyone, not just to benefit those who have it at the expense of everybody else because they're political insiders as property has been designed for since the days of ancient Egypt. So all of those things together, I mean, the first thing is the so-called libertarians who are mar the market libertarians who say that the market is about freedom are not entitled to the term libertarian. They're propertarians. They put a property ahead of freedom at every turn. Uh, where I mean, the human societies have been endlessly variable in the past and the present, and there's no way that humans are destined or obliged to organize ourselves in the future. We can organize ourselves as we choose and can change. Uh, it's more difficult in some circumstances than others, but we can do it in different ways, and the history of study can help us learn us how. So and then, of course, we argue for a basic income large enough to help protect every individual from being taken advantage of by everybody else. We have to do that because the commons is closed. The idea of restoring the commons is not realistic in the world today. Uh, but ownership for all, some minimal amount of ownership for all, is crucial. That's what we argue with the last thing. Okay, you probably have some disgusting things to say, but Benedict's hand was already up, so I can go to you first. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a pretty small point. Yeah. Um, not only when it comes to, so so take the example of Amazon, that's how my hand went up. Uh, not only when it comes to, you know, resources, but also when it comes to publicly funded things, yeah. you know, these companies profit immensely from, you know, all the Amazon logistics would be possible without the publicly funded road yeah. system. So we can even extend, I, Thing I would say, we could even, we can even extend that that argument from you know resources in the most you know general way to you know whatever the state funded at some point they use to thrive. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's only fair to make them you know to sort of I would say to force them. I would I would use the word force them to you know, pay their pet checks. But that was just you know a mere extension. Of the point. Wait. You're all looking at different aspects of my theory. In this, these last two books, I've been knocking down everybody else's theories. Um, and, and this is why, when you see at the end of these two books, you're why I, I am very unsympathetic with contemporary social contract theory and the contemporary national natural rights argument for private property. So I'm building up my own theory of justice in their place which I call justice is pursuit of accord. Um, I, I highly developed its theory of freedom. That's in the first book. Uh, well, uh, independence, property assistance, based income, colon, a theory of freedom is the power to say no. Which in that book, I outlay the theory of freedom and I'm still developing a richer property rights theory, uh, which is not complete. You get bits and pieces of it in the things that the rest of you are right are, are reading but look through these when you're looking through them look for my weaknesses thanks a lot for all this discussion really appreciate it and i will see you all one week from today